You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of RX Radio. Uh, so first and foremost, out of the gate, the RX programming is live. I know we've been kind of alluding to it over the last couple of weeks, um, but it is ready and up for subscription. And what we've done is we've actually made the first month free. So if you go to, right now to wwwpre scriptcom you'll get the first month of RX programming for free. So you can kind of see what it's all about. <laughs> Try before you buy, like me and Jenta are definitely, um, this has kind of been our brainchild for, honestly, since we started, this was something we wanted to roll out and something that's going to be ever evolving as we move forward as I think this is this is probably the crown jewel of I think what we have to offer it's just going to be a different spin on recovery on programming um, it's going to be an adjunct or something you can layer on to something you're currently doing and it's sole focus is to improve function around the shoulder, hip, and spine, right? You know, to better execute movements, for better programming, those are going to be your two tenets of injury risk management. Um, so that's going to be something that we're bringing live to you right now. We're bringing it to a month for free. So if you just go to www.pre-script.com, it'll be splattered all over the homepage, so we can't, won't have trouble finding it. And that's going to be RX programming. It's delivered through our app, video instruction, tutorials on every single movement we have. This library is ever expanding and I think it's currently at around 600 to 700 videos um, and they're going to be put together in a way you know in a logical order in each session as you progress through each week so something that guys um, you know if you've done our hypertrophy program if you've done our powerlifting or our Olympic weightlifting or you've gone through like individual programs like lower body reset or upper body reset or midline strength this is something that's going to be almost like the consolidated value of those. Uh, and it's going to be something that's super accessible. First month is going to be totally free. Uh, so if you guys head over to the website, sign up for that um, and just give it a shot. Give it a shot. Give us some feedback. Uh, we're always super open and eager to listen to how you guys do. We've had some pretty crazy success stories. Um, with the programs we've already released. And I think this one's going to be able to help uh, a lot of people, whether it's pain or performance. I think this one is really going to be something that resonates with a lot of people. So many people come to me like, oh, what do I do before I warm up for my shoulders, for my hips, for my low back, for my knees, for my elbows? Like this literally answers that question, right? You're training an upper body day. You go into the app, you grab, you grab the, the shoulder, uh, workout for that week and you integrate it in with the movements you're supposed to be doing on the on the workout side right this really takes all of the guesswork out of how to implement effective movement strategies around shoulder hip and spine right? you improve performance you increase range of motion you improve perception of stability it is going to allow you to better execute higher consistency of higher skill movements uh, and that's going to be what effectively gets you closer to your goals right we're not going to be strapping you with boots and throwing you in ice bath and all this recovery stuff good recovery starts from good programming and this will be the best recovery tool you have and you know i don't like speaking in absolutes but fuck if we haven't been working on this for four plus years now uh, so this is something where we're super proud of and you know want to give you guys give you guys a crack at it so it's going to be uh, it's going to be up for free there's going to be a promo code you need to put in um I want to say it's RX100, and you know I'm just going to say it because um, I'll just make it RX100. Uh, so go to the go to the online store, go to Prescript.com, type in RX100. So that's RXD100, and you get the first month totally for free. You get to download the app. You'll get to be have access to the Facebook community, which has been awesome because we have all of our level one coaches currently and pass through the program. We have a Telegram uh, group chat that we're all in. Um, these are really some of the brightest minds, uh, I think, in the fitness industry by a long shot. So a ton of value there, guys. And as long as you have, 
you know, your subscription to our X program and you have access to all of that. So hope you guys enjoy. Absolutely check it out. If you don't like it by the month, then, then cancel it and, you know, give us some feedback as to why. Now this episode, enough, enough pay the bills. Um, this episode is one long in the making. I, you know, I kept hearing whispers about this dude down in Florida who looked just like me. And I was like, I have to see this unfortunate looking fellow. And sure enough, everyone was talking about Phil DeRue. Now, Phil DeRue has been around in strength and conditioning, in powerlifting uh, for a long time. Albeit he's not that old. Uh, Phil works. Phil is probably the most accomplished strength coach in the mixed martial arts world. And he's, you know, he's extremely young, but he's extremely well-versed in a lot of methods of training. The best thing about Phil is he's creative, right? He understands the intent and he understands how to get the most out of his athletes. Phil's got, um, you know, great community coaches. He's helped build worldwide around that creative thought process, which is something that me and him definitely jive on. And, and hopefully we can do the same with the level one is promote that creativity. Cause I think that's something that's missing in strength and conditioning, right? We're trying to, we're trying to be the, the antithetical approach to the visor and the fucking khaki new balance strength coach. Um, so he's, his repertoire is built solely here's here's a, like a little bit of context of what kind of a badass you're dealing with as we were recording the podcast like we we're just kind of kicking it before it started and one of his guys was in signing a picture in his office and it was edson barbosa so he's like hold on man like i just got one of my fighters in my office and like he turns the camera and there's just this dude shredded to shredded to nothing. And I was like, who the fuck? Like, he's like writing on his walls. And I was like, no, 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 he's just, that's Edson Barbosa. He's like signing one of my, signing one of the pictures of my wall in his office. And I was like, all right, that's, that's badass. And, and just like, he's exactly who you'd want him to be in that position. Like just a no bullshit, you know, very, very evidence based in the, in the fact that he knows the research, he knows the practical application, he knows the sport, which is something we go into a huge amount of detail on. Um, so guys, I hope you enjoy this. Phil DeRue is quickly becoming one of my favorite people in the, the strength and conditioning world. Um, uh, to me, I think he just he just gets it, and he gets it from a people side, which we talk about a lot in this episode. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode with Phil. Make sure you guys check out www.pre-script.com uh, and then get your first month free of the RX programming, and we will see you guys next week. Obviously, we look a lot alike, but that's funny. So in the neighborhood you grew up in, there's one side of the tracks and there's a good side of the tracks. What side of the tracks did you grow up on? No, I grew up on the bad side of the track. Okay, all right. That's what I thought. I could hear it. Like, I hear it in the way you talk. I could see it. Like, just the way you hustle, man. Like, because something happened with your Instagram account, right? Like, something happened. You were, like, blown up. And then all of a sudden, it was like you were silent. And then you, like, had to literally build from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And then, dude, I think, like, you went from, like, zero to 80 in, like, a month. And I was like, only real, real a, followers, by the way, that's real followers. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. But only a broke kid hustles like that. That was literally my thought process. I was like, only a kid who grew up with like on the wrong side of the tracks would like go, Oh shit. They took it all away from me. I right. guess I'll go get it back again. Like just sand in his eye goes, all right, fuck it. I'll just go. Is this the rules? These are the rules. All right. I'm going to go get mine. Yeah. It's, it's a familiar, it's a familiar, uh, experience that i go through with that type of stuff you know so for me yeah, yeah the ufc people that run their instagram shut my account down twice actually shut it down twice the first time was because i reposted and they're coming down on everybody that reposts ufc like i guess their post in general so if i repost a ufc post they'll take it down and then they'll give me a warning or they'll shut the thing down completely so what happened was one of my fighters that I coach, I reposted them winning a fight and they gave me a warning, but they only gave me one warning and then automatically turned it off. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm going around. I'm like, man, what the hell? Like, first of all, I, I let you guys come in on the trainings that we do for the countdown show and give you these, you know, all this stuff. And then when I go to repost your own thing to actually help you guys out, you're going to tear mine down. So but it wasn't the UFC, it was just like an algorithm, I guess, the third party that they use to go after these people. So I called the UFC because I'm real close with a lot of the guy with a lot of the guys. And I know and I know the guy that runs their Instagram account. And so Yoana Yan Jacek was actually one of the one of the people that reached out 
directly to him and was like, we got to get him back on. But by the time that happened, I had lost like around, I think I lost around 20,000 followers or something like that. Like they cut them all out and then they, they deleted a lot of my posts. Like I had over 5,000 posts and they deleted almost half of them because they were all almost UFC related. You know, I've been working with ATT for, I've been working as a coach with ATT for like four or five years, but I was, I was a fighter for ATT for 11 years. So, you know, I guess they went all the way back. And when I was reposting about Dustin Poirier winning a fight, they, they got me for that one. So then it happened again. I got it all back and it happened again. This was real recent. Um, this was right before the MMA awards. And I was like, shit, man, because I, 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 I got nominated for trainer of the year and everything. And I was like, man, I really want to post this up and, you know, enjoy it. They cut it. They shut it down. Luckily, I was in Vegas for the award. So I went to the UFC directly. I went to the spot. So I was, that's not on the door. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, and honestly, man, they, those guys are awesome. Like the PI guys, they're awesome. Um, so they, they sent me over to the people that, that run their social media and then they ended up getting it back for me again, but it took a, like, it took like six weeks to fully get it back, man. And I was, I was, uh, I was struggling because again, a lot of my, a lot of the marketing that I do, a lot of my programs that I sell are all on Instagram. You know, I, I do a, a shit ton of that through my IG. Um, I think I make more off my Instagram than I would ever do on any other social media platform. So it's not just a fact of, oh, I lost like, oh, I lost my, my pictures and my videos that I put up of like my food and shit. It's literally like, you know, a, a good marketing tool that I use to help me make money. So I yeah, that's, dude, that's the annoying thing, man. Like, you know, you, you obviously, you have a powerlifting background and like, you know, a football background and all that. And there's like the old guard that really doesn't understand the business side. Like, you know, you talk to the old school guys who like, oh yeah, like cell phones in the gym. It's like, all right, man. All right. What, where do you work? Oh, you work at the steel factory. All right. What if I just came in and shut the lights off? Taking my cell phone away from me at a gym is literally like me closing your factory down. Like this is, it's not likes and subscribers, man. It's literally food on the table. And like, it's frustrating. Like, look, this is the evolution, adapt or die. Right. And you see a lot of the old dudes who just weren't able to get on board with it. Right. Like the, the guys who are like no cameras in the gym, all that. It's like, I understand and appreciate like the sanctity you're trying to build around the thing that we all love. But this is, this is V2.0, man. Like you got to trust that. Look, I love this just as much as you do. And this phone in the gym allows us to share what we do. And so it can actually mean something. So this can keep going. So all the weight that you lifted will actually be worth a damn to people who know what, what powerlifting is or what strength and conditioning is. It, it's kind of frustrating to be like, because you, like you said before we started, it was like, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are just putting out nonsense. And then you try and like, you almost like try and pay homage to the old guard and be like, you know, by paying it forward. And you kind of get like, you get some kickback from like the old school guys that you looked up to. It's like, look, man, like this is, this is the way it's going pops. Like this is, this is how it's got to be. Yeah. I think they get shafted for the fact that like they didn't get to it first, maybe, you know what I mean? And, and, and honestly, they didn't have the opportunity to. So they could have made a whole lot more money and they could have been a lot more, it, the notoriety would have been there, you know, for them. Like, and I know like, I'm obviously like, I, I follow a West side system. I'm close with Louie and those guys. And Louis hates phones, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, like, I know Tom is there making sure that he does all of his stuff for, you know, his social media and everything else, because they still have to build their brand no matter what. And that's where everybody's going nowadays. It's a gift and a curse in a lot of ways. Like, yes, you do need it for obviously, you know, building up your brand and building up, you know, I guess your bank account in a way. Um, but it can distract you from further things. And that's one thing that you have to separate it. You know, for me, when I go home, I put my phone away as much as I can. And now my time is spent with my family throughout the entire night once I'm all done. So I try to get as much as I can done in that entire day. So I don't have to revisit my phone or anything like that unless it's something like after they go to sleep or when I put my kids to bed. And then I can, you know, check my emails, check my DMs and all of that too as well. So again, I try to keep that, that balance as much as I can. Is it weird for you to just casually reference? Like, I still get tripped up. Sometimes I check my phone and I just see, like, the missed text messages I have and just the names of the people that are texting me. Like, you just casually reference. So I called the UFC, and I was like, yo, what up? Like, what are you guys doing? Like, dude, you called the UFC. That's like, yeah, so I had this parking ticket, right? So I called the, I called the president. It's like, what do you mean? Is it, is it ever, like, you're dialing, like, 
one eight hundred UFC or whatever the number is, and as it's ringing, you're like, what? Yeah. The, how the fuck did I get here? Yeah, sometimes, man. Like, like I have, I, I, I train a lot of the higher level guys, right? So for me, like now looking at it, like Andre Arlovsky's in my phone. He texts me on a daily basis, but like. 10 years ago, I'd be like, yo, that's Andre Olofsky. But now, he's just an old man that pisses me off sometimes. <laughs> like, like, I can say that because I love the guy, man. He's, he's, a, he's a true athlete, true fighter. But, yeah, and the same – like, even with you, man, like, having, having the ability to be, like, to DM you and be like, what's up, yo, how you doing, and, and, and getting to know you like that on that level because I've watched you grow, um, even with the YouTube channel and everything, man. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big – listen, guys, you guys are listening. I'm a big follower of Jordan, man. <laughs> All right, so the muscle doc is good with me. Trust me. That's, that's so even, – even that is silly for me to hear. Like, I hear that, and I was like, man – because I'm the same. I grew up, like – I grew up just opposite Detroit, Michigan, and, like, every issue that Detroit had where I grew up had the same problem. So it was just, like, you know, like, the only way out – like, I remember just watching – I dude, I used to watch John Meadows – grocery shopping videos before i used to watch hype videos to go get groceries i remember going to trader joe's for the first time and i'm like oh man i feel like and i was like watching the video in the parking lot like not even just going to the gym and then like getting to meet these guys it's like it's never like lost on me you're like holy fuck man this is crazy yeah that's how i felt when i was i mean i guess that's how i felt when i was with louis for the first time you know, watch, and Joe DeFranco too. Like when I, when I, you know, when I went to Joe's place, cause Joe actually invited me over cause I was working with Frankie Edgar at the time. So I was in Jersey and he was like, man, come over. And I'm like, really? I was like, all right, man. So I got there and I'm like, I'm about to go into the fucking Joe DeFranco's place right now. And we just kind of wrapped, you know, started talking. And when I started to get, when I got on this podcast, I, in my, in my brain, I am like, damn, I'm talking to Joe DeFranco right now. We're sitting talking <laughs> shit, like talking real, you know, buddy, buddy, like, and I'm like, man, I've been looking up to this guy since I was like 14 years old, you know? So it's really cool though. What was the first one? What was the first like name in the phone or fighter in the gym? Like palms get a bit sweaty, like, oh, don't fuck this one up. Yeah, so I mean, I got thrown into the fire with American Top Team from the jump. So I I, I fought for ATT. Um, my coach was Dean Thomas, um, so he was like a long time ATT veteran, and he was like one of their first UFC fighters. And uh, when I got the job, he was like, "Yo, can you get your resume together and bring it down, bring it down to Top Team." And I was like, "You know, it's 90 minutes away." I was like, "Absolutely." So I got my resume within you know two seconds, drove down 90 minutes, and then they were like, "All right." Here you go. And the first group that I had was Dustin Poirier, Hector Lombard, Tisha Torres, and uh, who else? Who else? Uh, I think it was and Mola Wall. So King Mo. So these guys are all high level, right? And I'm, and I'm sitting there training them. And then them thinking that I'm still a fighter, not a coach, because they know me for just going down there to spar. And I'm like, man, these guys are actually putting their trust in me to get them to where they need to be. And these guys are all top 10 in the UFC or, or, or Bellator champions or whatever. And so when I got that, I think that I was like, all right, when, when I was able to produce results with that caliber of athlete, I was like, okay, now we're, we got it. But I think the first time where I was like, oh, shit, I better not fuck this up, that moment was Yoana and Jacek coming into the gym. And you wanna, I, I got her on, you know, on my walls and stuff. And I knew her from watching her fight. And I was like, this chick is badass, man. When she walked into the gym, she just had that, that facade, like, don't fuck with me, you know? And um, I remember the first day we, I trained her on a Sunday, believe it or not, because we were just trying to get a feel for each other. And the whole time I'm training, I'm like, man, I'm training one of the baddest chicks in the world right now. Cause this was actually before Amanda, like Nunez got, got famous, really. This was before Amanda even, I think, had a title shot or anything. So it was, it was Joanna and Jacek who was the baddest female along with Ronda Rousey or something like that, I think, at that time. So I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm training the second baddest female on the planet right now. That's when I was like, damn, okay, let me get my shit together. That's crazy, man. Like, and that's a weird kind of thing that most trainers don't experience. Like, because you think, you know, you're dealing with these really tough, like the toughest people on the planet or like the strongest people on the planet. And the first thing that goes through like a good coach's mind and every, every coach I've ever talked to is don't fuck it up and don't fuck it up. Like, you know, like don't program bad for them. Obviously that's like in, in your mind or like, don't let them execute, but like 
here you have literally like the epitome of human function. It's like the most violent motherfuckers you've ever met. And all you can think about is I just, I don't, please don't get hurt. Yeah. It's like, dude, their whole job is to take a fucking battering ram and you're in there just like with barbells going, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God. But it's like, walk me through like, have you ever had a point in the gym where you're like, you've had to like draw the line? Cause I know like I've worked with a handful of Bellator UFC guys and the hardest thing with them is reining them in. Right. And like sticking to a, their program is like, I'm going to run through that wall and I'm going to keep running through it. And you know, from like a coaching standpoint, that's not good. What's been your biggest obstacle in overcoming with like that aspect of just getting around that mindset of these guys just want to go, go, go. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, a lot of my guys have been for the longest. So like they're at the top of their game and they've probably been there for a couple of years now. So they understand that, you know, they do have to manage their body and manage their outputs because they're, they're doing multiple sessions throughout the days and weeks. In an ATT, every training session is maximal effort because of the fact that your training partners are other high level, you know, UFC fighters or champions and other, other promotions. So every time they spar, it's maximal effort. Every time they're in a wrestling class, it's maximal effort, you know. So for me, it was easier for me to watch the practices because I knew how it felt because I was a fighter myself. And being able to auto-regulate on spot no matter what. Um, but draw, bringing them back into the point where they, they, they would say, like, um, you know, is that it? Because they felt like they needed to be exhausted, dead, laying on the floor, not being able to breathe. But I just reiterated the fact that we want to train optimally not maximally. And, you know, don't think it's just one day that you need to kill yourself. You need to make sure that you're expanding this throughout the entire training camp and the entire year, because there is no real off season for us, right? We're always training. We're always trying to adapt and get better. So for me, it was more of a sense of educating them on, on proper programming and understanding fatigue management. And also using things like objective indicators did help me out a lot because I can use that technical data so i'm not the bad guy being like yeah we don't you don't look good today man and they're like what the fuck you mean i don't look good or you know i'm good i feel good coach yeah and i'm like nope here it is you know exactly so yeah i think that that's helped me out a lot hrb monitors uh again with the gym aware that's helped me out you know but and then and then once you get a feel for the athlete once they get comfortable with you and you you probably know this real well jordan is that like they're not afraid to tell you how they feel once they get to know you and know that you care about them and that's a major thing is like communication is key. I, I sit my guys down for at least two to three hours almost and just hash out a conversation to actually see what type of individual they are, like what type of personality do they have. And then I can go ahead and coach them the way I need to coach them. And then from there, it's just, a, you, know, a, you know, constant communication each day and then seeing how they feel, seeing what their schedule's like. And then from there, I can base, all, I can base their training on, in real time that day based off of what they've done and how they're looking. Yeah, you're one of the few people that I think really like embodies or understands the importance of like what it means to be a coach. Like I think so many people, because I mean, I get it. I could only imagine with like the popularity of the UFC and like just the, the pedigree of the guys that you work with, like how many DMs you get. Not from like, hey man, I'm like an up and coming fighter, but hey, I'm an up and coming strength coach. You know, any advice? Because it's like, it's, I guess maybe this, what is the advice that you give to up and coming strength coaches that want to get specific and niche into the, like into the UFC or combat sports world? Well, first, first thing, like you need to engulf yourself in the sport. You know, you can't just be a guy that just like, kind of, like, like I see a lot of these kids come from, and I get a lot of interns come from like universities and then they get into a gym like American top team. And they're like, what the fuck do I do with all these killers? And you got to know the sport. And honestly, you don't have to be a fighter. You don't have to ever fight in a cage or anything like that. But you should at least train it to understand, one, the, the biochemistry of it, the biomechanics of it, and also just the, the psychology of it. You know, um, that was one thing that I did have an upper hand on was the fact that I used to train with these individuals or I trained it myself for so long that I, I know exactly how they're feeling in a camp. I know how they're feeling when they're weight cutting. Um, and then again, I also say just, you gotta get on the floor and start coaching every individual that you can, because everybody's different. Everybody's gonna have their, their different, you know, problems and dysfunctions and compensation patterns. And you gotta be able to identify and then auto-regulate on spot because you don't have time to sit there and be like, oh wait, hold on. 
you got to make sure that everything flows and you got a limited time to get it done, especially in a sport like MMA where there's multiple things going on each day. Yeah, man, like I've, you know, being out by Combat Sports Academy, my second office was in CSA with those guys. And just I watching some of them and getting to work with them, it's like it's it's different. Like I, I'm, from, I'm from Canada originally, and I started off working with like hockey and lacrosse. And it's one thing, and this is something I tell people, even when I was in the Bay Area, it's like, look, it's one thing when you got a program for a guy whose biggest fear is some other guy going for the puck in the corner. It's another thing when you got a program for a guy who his opponent is coming for the heart in his chest. Like it's such a different animal. Like I, I remember um, I had this one girl come off a Bellator card at SAP and she's like, oh, I'm like, how you feel? Like next day, like she did well, she won rough fight she was pretty beat up and it's like yeah yeah i feel good i think i want to get back in the gym i was like no give it give it like a week uh, she's like what do you mean like i feel great i was like just please just give it like you don't understand what your sympathetic nervous system just went through like i got hit by a i got hit by a 91 suburban five years ago on my bicycle oh, and it's nowhere near the impact that this girl like went through in that one night on like a saturday night card and sure enough, like a week later, it's like, fuck, my shoulder is killing me. What the hell? I just woke up one morning. It's like, no, no, no. It, it's not, you didn't wake up one morning. You were in like a fucking five round fight last weekend. Yeah, it's yeah. programming for fighters, man. It's a nightmare. Like I, I watch you and my, I just, my, I, my hair falls out. I get so stressed when I watch you with your guys. And I'm just like, oh my God, this yeah. is awful. And the worst thing too, like, do you get this? Like when they go in for fights, you kind of turn into like the soccer mom. Oh, always, 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 <laughs> always. I, it was worse for me. Um, I, I, like I say, I was getting more nervous for when my guys fight than when I fought myself. You know what I mean? Because you, you have no, like, once it's over, like, once the cage door closes, that's on them. And then you're kind of just like, uh, you know, like, the whole time I was in Vegas for the for the Yoana fight, and I was just, like, in on the edge of my seat, you know, because I'm watching a girl that I really care about. And, bro, it was, like, a brutal. You got, you did you watch the fight? Yeah. It's a brutal fight, man. So, but I was super proud of her, man. She put it out on the line. But yeah, I'm I'm just like that. You could call me a soccer mom all day with that one, dude. I bet I went to a handful of them, and like, I just wanted to turn it into a WWE thing. I'm like, I'm sitting on a steel chair. Tag me in. I just want like get just stop it. Hey, stop it. It's just like, but it's it's kind of like it's the nature of the beast, right? Like that's that's the sport. And like you, you mentioned like having, having guys come in and, and that's the hard part. Like, I mean, I, I was a bouncer in a nightclub. I played hockey to a pretty high level. So like I've broken a few knuckles and not knowing what to do, yeah, yeah. but a lot of me getting by with the fighting crowd was like, yeah, that guy looks like if, you know, he could, might be able to hold his, I couldn't imagine like the undergrad pocket protector in the polo tucked into the khaki new balance strength coach going into the fucking jungle at AZT. Just like, Whoa, Dorothy, you're a long way from Kansas homes. Like this is a different animal. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like I do have my own little style and it's good that I grew up in the area that I grew up in. I really don't get, it's not intimidation. It's more of a fact that I want to see these people succeed so much that I'm just like, I'm always trying to outdo my own self, you know? Um, but I think it's a good mix because we're like-minded individuals, no matter what, like, so are like me and you like-minded individuals. We're always trying to progress, always trying to get better, always trying to be the best that we can be. And then on top of that, we're always trying to go through it like savage and make sure that we're putting all of our effort into it. So that was something that I knew that they took to, because in the beginning, there was a strength coach like that before I got there. And I knew that he was doing a good job. Like he understood the science and everything, but he didn't understand them as individuals, you know? And, and that was just because of the fact that he's never been in it and it's not no knock on him, but the great thing about it, like I said, is that I've been in it. So. I think the one thing that helped a lot for me was like, you talked about, you know, you can know the sports, you can know the science, but to know the people I found in getting into sports, knowing the history is super effective. Like if I sit down at a table and someone goes, yeah, so Konstantin Konstantinovs. And like, I'm talking to a bunch of powerlifters and I'm sitting there going, who? They're like, yeah. get this fucking jabroni out of here. Are you serious? Like KK is the fucking goat. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. oh shit. So that's like one thing when people want to get niche, it's like, it's a weird piece of advice, but look, if you're in it, 
be in it, be about it, like, you know, bleed the shit kind of thing. And that's where one, like a lot of people, when they come to me like, Hey, I'm really into powerlifting and I have this gym nearby. Like, and one of the first questions I ask is, you know, what, what, what's this guy's total? Like, I know all my lift is sad. Like I know all my lifters, even not my, uh, my buddy, Jeremy Avila, who's like one of the best 220 lifters in the, in the States. He just hopped on a live the other day and was like shooting me questions. I was like, Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy, and he's just, I'm like, Jeremy Avila's best deadlift was at Boss of Bosses 2. It was a, it was a 402.5 kilo deadlift, which is 884 pounds. And he's like, how the fuck do you know that? It's like, dude, because this is it. Like, you got to, like, because you know what? I think people, your athletes will always be able to tell. They'll okay. always be able to know when you're not real with them, when you're not really about it. And, like, it's different now, man. Like, when I came up in strength and conditioning, and now, like, dude, I've watched some of the collegiate paychecks. Like, mm-hmm. fuck, I was at Stanford, and, like, Shannon Turley was getting well over, like, 500K a year as a, as a strength coach. Wow. Like yeah. that – and this guy's up in Oregon and, like, what some of, some of, the, some of the blue bloods in the, in the basketball world, like, they're getting five, six. Like, think, are you – what? The strength coach for Alabama was getting, making a million, isn't he making like at least 500 to like, Hey, money's got to go somewhere. You didn't get cut a check. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Sure, so let's talk about that. I mean, cause you got a football background, right? Why? I guess, I mean, football strength and conditioning coming up, like that was strength and conditioning, right? That was the first sport that really took it on. Like, obviously like weightlifting was probably the inception of like organized programming around a sport, but like corresponding to like a field sport or something that was, the sport wasn't on a barbell, especially at Bama. Like why did you decide to go the fighting route rather than sticking it out with a football route, especially with your education background? Yeah. So it, it was actually an unfortunate incident to be honest with you. So I was stuck. I was, it was my, it was my uh, junior year in college and I was doing well, man. I was obviously I'm five, eight, you know, but I was the gunner on the kickoff team. I played strong safety. There was a ton of concussions going on throughout my years of high school, you know, but that wasn't a big deal for me. I, I kind of just like brushed it under the rug, but my parents actually ended up getting real sick. My mom developed lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. And then my father ended up being wheelchair bound. So there was really no money coming into my family and we grew up not so great anyways. And I have a, a sister that's 10 years younger than me. And uh, at that time, you know, I was pretty much trying to take care of the family. Um, you, you know, the NCAA wouldn't allow us to get jobs. So money wasn't coming in. So I had a decision to make. And even though this was like my childhood dream is to make it to the NFL or at least make it to the next level, um, my family was more important. So I ended up canceling my scholarship, leaving there and then finishing up my degree um, in a nearby town that they moved out of. Um, they moved out of the, the neighborhood we were in, thank God, and moved up to a, a small place called Port St. Lucie, which is like population at that point was probably like 500, bro. It was like, it was fucking bad. So I moved there and I'm like, wow, there's really nothing to do. But in the meantime, I was still boxing on the off season and I had an alias name so that the NCAA wouldn't catch me. So, like, I don't even remember what it was. It was probably, like, Matt Jones or some shit. I don't know. But I remember I was just doing really well in it, and they were like, man, you got a, you got a real talent for this because I was a fight fan all my life, you know. Um, I, I did Kempo Karate, and I even did some boxing at ATT when I was living down there. Um, but, you know, so when I left, I'm like, all right, man, I need to compete. I need to do something. And then so, so I was going to box. I was, gonna, I was just going to be a boxer, you know. And then I started looking at, you know, uh, this was right around the time that the Ultimate Fighter 2 came out. And uh, I was watching it, and I was like, man, this is, this is something, man. Like, I can really do this. Merge all of these, these aspects together. Utilize my athleticism from football and make it happen. So I, I reached out to Dean Thomas, who actually had a satellite American top team school in Port St. Lucie. So I went out there and I, and I basically, I ran up on him when he was like opening up the door. And I remember this, man, you, you hear my, you hear my, my voice now, like it sounds a little hood. Some people say I sound black and I apologize. <laughs> like, for, I don't apologize, but you know, my boy sitting here cause he, he was in high school with me and they actually work together now, but he remembers. And you can imagine I was probably 10 times worse 11 years ago. And I rolled up on Dean and I was like, yo, I want to fight, like literally. And this guy's a UFC veteran, man. He was like, 
he was like, all right. But I was like, man, I want to fight. I want to, I want to train. And he was like, go ahead and try a class, you know, later on today. And then I started doing it and my, you know, took to it very well, uh, undefeated as an amateur did, you know, a couple of pro fights to where I understood that this was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life, or at least be a part of it for the rest of my life. You know? When did the transition go from like, from in the ring to behind the desk? Like, you know, you're obviously, you came into ATT, you had that familiarity with some of the top guys as an athlete, like as someone who would be in the class rather than at the front of the class. Like, I know just personally, like, you know, creating an e-commerce business, I didn't even know what, I couldn't even fucking spell e-commerce four years ago. And like, cause I was in it, man. Like, you know, my two training partners were the strongest dudes in the world. I just got out of grad school, was in a ton of debt. And like, I just wanted to lift a bunch of heavy weights and then, Next thing you know, it's like, there's like, I got a PayPal account. I got a YouTube channel kind of, and I, I got to put all this shit together. When did you start to realize like, okay, my focus needs to be on the business end. There's a career here. There's a family that needs to get taken care of. I need to, you know, I need to step out of the cage and, and get behind, get behind the big desk. Well, I always had like a, an entrepreneurial spirit just from growing up to where I, you know, I've grown up at. And like, I've always, you know, I'm selling baseball cards. <laughs> okay. What else you sell it, dog? All right. <laughs> to be honest, all right, baseball card. Get the fuck out of here with baseball. Hey, can I, baseball get a, can I get an eight ball of baseball cards? Can I get an eight ball of baseball cards? Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Get What the fuck? Who do you think you're talking to here, man? Get out of here. Baseball. I swear they're baseball cards, I officer. I didn't know if this was PG-13 or not, man. <laughs> We're selling baseball cards. Get out of here. I don't even know if I own a baseball card, so let's just put it like that. I was saying something like baseball cards, all right? <laughs> so, anyways, um, and, and I got into a little bit of trouble, obviously, from that point. You know, I, I was I – was, <laughs> If you really want to backtrack it, like I, I, I was actually very really highly recruited. Um, one of my one of my teammates was Jason Pierre Paul, who played for the played for the Giants, blew his hand off. Um, we were all pretty, you know, pretty talented in my in my in my junior, my senior year of high school. Um, but I actually had to transfer schools. And this I, I said this probably one other podcast. I think I said it on um, on Bart Kwan's podcast, but actually ended up getting getting in a lot of trouble. So I ended up getting in a uh, full on brawl at my sophomore year of high school. And I ended up pretty much beating this kid down like pretty bad because just long story short, he, he was threatening my boy and then, you know, stupid shit. And so I actually stepped up and, and ended up smashing this kid. And then, you know, they ended up pressing charges and they, they got me for attempted murder. Because oh. Of, yeah, because of the fact that I was actually still training. I was training boxing and I had like a, a karate background so they already automatically try to like typecast me as a person that's deadly or whatever but I beat him up pretty bad you know and it was just more the fact that like I was super angry at my surroundings and what I was going through you know had a tough upbringing so with that like I was getting offers from like Clemson uh, what else uh, Clemson North Carolina State Duke and some other schools and uh and Rutgers or something like that, and uh, they all dropped me. They were like, you know, that's it. So Alabama State, not Alabama, but Alabama State was actually there and kept with me, and I ended up actually going there and, and just, you know, trying to make a name for myself there. But – go ahead. No, that probably upped your standing at Bama State. It's like, well, this guy's got charges. All right, <laughs> give, him some, yeah, give him some more. Yeah. Give him the good dorm. Give him the good dorm. the fact that I had fucking gold teeth and, and a shape <laughs> – I was doing it, man. Like, but <laughs> <laughs> I was doing it, man. So I don't even know where the fuck I was going with this one. I, where was I? At? Entrepreneurial baseball card <laughs> selling spirit <laughs> up on the block. Your yeah, boy so, Phil Deru. Block, you know, a little bit of smell to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah. So like, when I got out of school, I was kind of like, all right, well, you know, I I I I got a I got a I think I got a um, what did I get? I got like a bullshit A certification or something like that just to train people. And I remember sneaking people into Gold's Gym, but, you know, at the same time, I was finishing up my degree and uh, finally got uh, the CSCS once I finished my degree. So I had two certifications, had the degree, um, but for the most part, I was just sneaking people into like Gold's Gym and LA Fitness and just trying to make it work for like $20, $30 a session. But it was working for me. And um, I, met a, I met an individual when I was training for fights. I met an individual by the name of Tony Montgomery. And um, so, yeah, yeah, I know, right? Tony's my heart, man. Love that guy. 
So Tony's actually, I'm actually going to get on Tony's podcast Saturday, um, but he's going to be on mine too. But Tony started me out, man, when I was in, when I was like just starting as an amateur fighter, going into my pro career, he really started me out on, you know, basically it was a powerlifting gym, strongman gym that he had. So I got immersed in all of that, you know, and from there he gave me the opportunity to really train people full time as an independent contractor. So I started hustling. I was bringing everybody in there to the point where like he had to up my rent like two or $300. And then I was like, all right, Tony, man. So I'm paying like this amount of money. I'm probably just going to go ahead and just buy my own spot. So that's what I ended up doing. No. And it was, and we never like no ill will or anything like that. It's kind of like, you know, it just makes sense financially, you know? So open up like a small warehouse facility, an 800 square feet facility. And I was like 22 years old at the time. So I had roughly 12 dedicated clients. And one of them was actually my, ended up being my wife. Um, and so 12 dedicated individuals. And then by the six month that I was in there, we grew out of that. I moved into 1900 square foot facility where the old American top team was at. And then after that, about eight months later, um, we grew out of that and they wouldn't allow us to work out outside. So the landlord next door gave me the 11,000 square foot facility just based off of me talking to him and telling him what my business plan was. And he gave it to me for half off. So that actually helped out. So built that up and uh, we ended up getting around roughly around 250 to 300 members in that gym because I had a boxing ring at this time. I had full mat space. I had a full size cage because the guys that, um, that own the cage, um, they did a, they did an amateur show around that area. And, uh, and I was the main event for their first amateur show. So they let me hold the cage in there. So I got a free cage. I got uh, a ring from my boy that was a box was my boxing coach. He put that in there. And then I had all of Tony Montgomery's equipment that he got. So I had a full gym, like, I want to, I want to say maybe $80,000 worth of stuff, maybe even more in this gym um, for damn near free because of the hustle that I had and people and just having the ability to communicate with people too. You know, I think that carried over, but yeah. So getting to that, like after, after, and at the same time, I was still fighting as a pro. So after all of that, I'm still fighting as a pro. I'm still running a business. Um, again, not really business savvy, like street savvy, understanding people, right? I don't even think I had like, I don't even think I had QuickBooks or anything to like measure out what I, I think I was like still collecting money and putting it in a shoebox underneath my bed and shit, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, man, you, and I remember my wife being like, you got to get a bank account. Like, What the fuck are you doing? And luckily she's eight years older than me. So like she kind of guides me to the, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> So I keep her young and she keeps me smart. So we'll, we'll keep that going, you know? Yeah, I think that's, that sounds like a way harder job for her, dog. <laughs> sounds, uh, I don't know what you're paying her, but it's not yeah. enough. Now, I mean, so you got, the, you got the new spots. What's, I mean, what's coming up? What's down the pipe? Like, because that's the thing. Like, you don't, there's no taking the foot off the gas, right? Like, it's always, like, what actually, and I could imagine, like, in the current state of affairs, everyone's got a lockdown. You got to be, like, like just like a like a like a fucking caged animal like what's what's like when you come out on the other side of this shit hopefully starts opening up the next couple of weeks like what's what's the play well right now like i said i'm 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 developing another program and i'm collaborating with mo vaughn who is a ex-baseball player hall of fame baseball player played for the red sox the angels a couple of other guys but he's actually opening up an eleven thousand square foot facility compound pretty much and it's a complex full of more for uh, hitting practice and, and, and throwing practice. And then I'm gonna go in there and uh, open up a small gym to help with the kids there. And work out my athletes there too as well. We're inside my gym now, so I'm, I'm looking to build that up too as well. Work with the tactical athletes as, as well too. And then also, you know, just keep on with my fighters. As far as seminars go, I'm down. I mean, I've done, I've done 13, 14 countries so far. So I'm really trying to take it over, man. I'm trying to get to your level. Forget that. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait. When I'm in Florida, we'll sit down and we'll compare passports and we'll see where <laughs> we're at. But that's that's a dude. That's a hustle, man. Fourteen. Kind of, I was. I had Eugene To on the other day, and honestly, when I, when I sat sat down, like when all this kind of halted, like I'm right in the middle of like two years on the road, and I was starting to think like, because it was just normal. Like I'm sure you just did it. And you're like, oh, like this is just what you had to do to this was work. Like when I went to the airport, it's like, all right, off to the office. 
and I literally thought about like who who this isn't normal this is weird like who out there even does this like I bet you I can like I know most people by first name who live this kind of life and no shit like maybe a month ago the like the two top of the list that I knew did what I did were you and Eugene and <laughs> just like nice cruiser yeah because it, it's different man like because you start to realize that there's no discernible difference between like where my life begins and where my job ends. Like, you know, it's not, it's not a nine to five. It's not a 24 seven or it's a 24 seven thing. And like, I commend, like when you talked about, you know, when the, the day is over, the phone goes down and it's, I'm still trying to find that. Like, you know, my girl sitting there looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what, are you serious right now with this shit? Like, I got to wake up tomorrow and, and do a live with Mamba Sports Academy. I'm in Australia. I got to do it at 4 a.m. in the morning. And she's not going to be thrilled about it. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's either I work all day year round or I don't work at all. I can't really tell. Yeah, well, it's good that you have somebody there that understands that, though. You know what I mean? And my wife understands that, too. And, and my kids do, you know, to a degree. And, and like as much as they can. My son is five years old. So like, for me, like, when I when I get home, no matter how I'm feeling, no matter how tired I am, no matter what I got to do later on, I'm going to play with him until he has to go to sleep, because that's my job too, as well. So there's two jobs there. It's not like I'm, it's not like, okay, it's downtime. Yeah, it's downtime, but I'm still working. I'm still working as as a father. You know what I mean? So I get it. man. Dude, that's, that's, I, that's the thing. I barely take care of myself, man. Like, to like i think i wear a lot of hats like i set up this whole and you know we were talking about like getting the email squared away and like understanding how to work zoom and i'm sitting there like yay like i know how to but like i mean no joke when you started off i'm sure especially with the like, instagram stuff like you know you know the difference between like a dslr camera like i know the difference between a mirrorless camera and a non-mirrorless camera i know how to set up an, an h6 i'm like a low level audio engineer like i know how to like integrate systems and i know what the back end of websites look like yeah that's a lot of hats and i sit up my i used to look at myself and go oh god you're just incredible look at you go <laughs> look at you go and but like dude you yeah right pat on the back how is the transition? Well, I suppose not transition for five years, but like the family side is like a whole nother thing like that. How difficult is that to balance with, you know, everything you got going on? Cause you, you wear the trainer hat, you wear like, you know, Hey, we, content is, this is marketing. This is business. We got to shoot a YouTube video. We got to do a podcast. Oh shit. I actually got to train someone. This person has a fight coming up. I got to be here. I got to go do this seminar. And I still have this whole massive other like, equally if not more important part of my life and the family how is it balancing that now i would be lying to say it, you know it's not difficult you know what i'm saying it, it's definitely a difficult path um i have three kids and i have a you know tremendously understanding wife on top of that i think the thing is that like having a good support system a good support team i guess you would say having people that you could delegate to um when things when you need things done, like my whole team, I have a whole media team, you, you know, Lena reached out to you. Um, you know, I have Chris, I have Devin, these guys helped me out so much to where like, I really don't have to focus on the only thing that I have to focus on is what I'm good at. You know what I mean? And then from there, when it comes down to my family, I just, I just go the extra mile. Just like I did when I was getting ready for football, just like when I was getting ready for fights, I just put in the hard work and that's, that's hard work that it comes with a, a even better outcome because at the end of the day, I want my family, I want my kids to know that I was there from every step of the way. I didn't have that as a kid, so I want to give that to them. And I go hard in every aspect of my life, and that's how I treat it. Crazy. Man, I appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on. We'll, uh, we'll definitely do this again in person. I'm looking forward to getting out to the new spot when all this. That'll, I might just see if I can get a direct flight from Australia to Boca. Like, just whatever it costs. Just drop me right in Boca. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, real quick, we'll do the whole rundown thing. I'll put it all in the show notes where people find you. Uh, yeah. Seminar info, website, stuff like that. Yeah, um, I have a website, DeRouStrong.com. My Instagram is at DeRouStrong. Twitter is at DeRouStrong. Um, I have a program out now. It's a body armor, which is like an eight week body weight only program for people on quarantine. That's 50% off. And then I also have a mentorship course that I use for coaches only. So I have about 300 coaches that are in that mentorship course. You can find that on my website too, as well. And I want to thank you, Jordan, man, for, for letting me come on, man. I actually like, enjoy talking to you. There's a lot of guys that I get on with interviews and I'm like, 
But I like talking to you, man. So this is cool. Yeah, all right. I'm, I, I, anyone who can call out your baseball card bullshit. Is, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many podcasts you've been able to fly that on. I sell a baseball card. Oh, really? Wow, right on. Yeah, uh, awesome. No, man. That's awesome. What kind of baseball card? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. You'd always tell when you find someone cut from the same block, man. So I'm looking forward to doing this in person, man. I really appreciate your time. For sure, man. Thank you. All right. Cheers, bud.